Thank you for joining the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Houston for our weekly online ministers forum. These programs are recorded each week on Monday and posted online on Wednesday. I'm the Reverend Dr. Colin Vossen, Senior Minister of the Congregation. And these are conversations with community organizers, scholars, religious leaders, and others about how we, are how we can collectively address the grave health, economic, and social crisis we are facing. The purpose of these conversations is to offer members of our community and all who wish to join us online science-based resources and liberation-oriented religious inspiration to get through these difficult and extraordinary times. Today I'm joined by Diana Tang. Diana is, the, is an organizer with the Metropolitan Organization, or TMO, an interfaith network of congregations and other institutions who are dedicated to developing power and leadership among citizens so that we can collectively transform our city. Diana taught middle school English as a second language with the Houston Independent School District through Teach for America. She later served as the Senior Managing Director of Teach for America in Houston. As an organizer with TMO, she supports member institutions in the Third Ward, Fifth Ward, Cashmere Gardens, and Homestead communities. For those of you who are with us for the first time, let me say a few words about Unitarian Universalism. We are a religious tradition that celebrates the possibility of goodness within each human heart the transformative power of love, and the clarifying force of reason. We believe we need not think alike to love alike. We hope that you find these forums a source of connection, hope, and clarity. Dana, Diana, I'm wondering if you could start by talking with us a bit about what TMO is and why community organizing is important at this time. Of course. Um, thank you so much for having me here. Um, well, TMO, the Metropolitan Organization, um, we've been around in Houston for about 40 years and really started together when multiple institutions across, you know, many faith backgrounds came together because they realized there were so many um, issues that were putting pressures on families, but that families individually didn't feel like they had a voice to address these issues. And so the heart of, of TMO's work is really working with um you know, congregations from all different faith backgrounds, schools, nonprofits, to really build relational power um, to ensure that the institutions are strong and to collectively act, um, advocate for um, those changes. Um, why organizing is so important at this time, um, I think it is just crucial that one, uh, we are able to facilitate those conversations so people don't feel isolated um, and they don't feel hopeless. Um, and so that we can continue to really identify not only the needs that our community is facing right now during this pandemic, but also to identify the leaders in the community and the institutions who are ready to step up, speak out about what families need, and then work together to be able to advocate for those changes with many of our, our public officials. Okay, well, thank you. That's, uh, I think, very, would be very interesting to know for a lot of the people who are watching this, um, since community organizing is one of these things that I think is a term that gets thrown out a lot, but people don't necessarily know exactly what it is. And I, I understand that one of the major functions of both TMO and community organizing is to help people connect to needed resources. And right now there's a lot of families that have been impacted financially by the pandemic through lost hours and jobs. And I think the unemployment rate right now is forecast to hit something like 30% in the next couple of months. So what advice would you have for someone if they were to lose their job right now? Yes. Um, yeah, I do think that this is probably one of the most pressing situations um, is, is lost jobs or just a significant loss of, of hours of work. Um, so I would say the, the first and foremost thing that we are sharing with people is that, you know, for those that are eligible to apply for unemployment to, to actually register and apply as soon as possible. Um, this definitely includes people who are self-employed. Um, they might be an independent contractor. And so they're able to apply with the state of Texas and receive benefits from the Disaster Unemployment Assistance Program. 
Um, to qualify for unemployment, you do need to be a U.S. citizen or legally authorized to work in, in the U.S. Um, but if people have questions about whether they're eligible and, or not, um, we have some information provided on our website at www.tmohouston.org. Um, but we are also encouraging people to directly make contact um, with the, the unemployment programs to be able to suss out for themselves if they are eligible. So there are two ways people can apply. One is via phone and one is via the internet. Um, so the phone lines have been backed up because so many people are currently applying. Um, and so, you know, if you have access to the internet, it may be easier to get through at that time. And if something is busy, we're just asking people to like, try back again in five minutes, try back again in 10 minutes. Um, I think that'll be really beneficial because the sooner that you're able to get into the program, the sooner you'll be able to get financial relief during that period. Um, and then we also have um, provided some additional information for people to better understand, you know, who will be eligible for the stimulus checks that will be coming out um, and, you know, some resources for people if they still need to file a tax return. Um, the stimulus checks will be determined by either this year's tax return for 2019, if you've already filed it this year, um, or for your 2018 tax return. So, um, I do think that whether it is people individually who have been impacted or if they have children or family members that have lost their jobs, um, again, the, the guidance we've been giving people is to apply for unemployment as soon as possible. And if it is busy, to, to definitely try again. Um, and then the only other thing that we wanted to share was that, you know, I imagine that many families will need, you know, um, that support from unemployment or from the stimulus check for current living expenses like food, um, you know, rent, immediate needs. And so um, we do know that there are families out there that um, may, you know, be connected with other payday lending programs that will do automatic withdrawals. And so if you are expecting, uh, you know, whether that stimulus check or unemployment to come in, that um, you take time now to actually cancel those automatic withdrawals so that you're able to use them for the needs currently. Um, I do think every family needs to be aware that as of right now, um, you may still be needing to pay back some of those fees and, um, you know, the loans, but that just to be careful that your money will not automatically be withdrawn if you have more pressing needs that you want to use that for. I think that's a really important point because payday lenders are just, uh, I mean, can just be very aggressive and collecting. And especially at this time when, uh, you know, people are really desperate, um, not letting money go to them if you haven't possibility of preventing that is, I think, super, super important and something people need to know that they can do. Uh, so I think another thing that is of great concern right now is housing because, uh, you know, as people are losing their jobs, they're losing their ability to pay rent. Um, and I know that there have been many calls from advocacy groups, including TMO, for moratoriums on evictions in utilities here in Texas and in other states and cities there's even been mass rent strikes organized um, by tenants unions and others. And I'm wondering right now what advice you have about where people can turn to for housing needs. Yeah, I do think that this is, you know, one of the major expenses um, that many families are facing. Um, currently, due to kind of like the collective advocacy work, um, both locally and across the state of Texas, um, there uh, has been a pause in any type of eviction, um, you know, you know, prosecution in, in the courts. And so right now across the state, there will be no evictions that are processed all the way through April 26th. Um, given that, you know, so we have continued to extend the stay at home period, um, we will collectively be keeping an eye on that to make sure that that, you know, if, if there's a possibility of extending um, that, uh, that notice. Um, we also recognize that while this is the case that they won't be, you know, actually processing any evictions, that doesn't stop, um, you know, landlords or apartment associations from still, you know, reaching out and asking for rent from families. Um, and so if people, um, 
do have, you know, questions around if they're, you know, feeling like they're getting pressure and they're not really sure what their rights are. Um, there's a number of different organizations to reach out to. Um, if they are connected um, through, you know, a congregation with TMO, they should let us know. Um, there is also Texas Housers is a great organization that is, you know, doing a lot of work to identify if there's specific parts of town or specific, you know, um, landlords that are um, unduly putting stress on families. Um, and then we also have been sharing uh, some of the resources for Lone Star Legal Aid or the Texas State Bar Referral Services um, to make their phone numbers available for people. Um, as of right now, you know, while no evictions are being processed, um, essentially people will still need to pay their rent back, um, you know, after kind of the stay at home orders have been lifted. And so we're still looking for ways to be able to address that because we do know that's like, even if people temporarily don't have to pay, so they are avoid eviction, that having two or three months worth of rent will be quite a, quite a burden for folks. Um, and so organizations, you know, like United Way through 211 are still, you know, offering rent assistance um, through different programs to families. Um, and then the other piece connected kind of with housing needs is around uh, utilities. Um, so uh, we did, we were, we were able to get some of our leaders to work with um, our sister organizations across the state of Texas to advocate with the Texas Public Utilities Commission. And so as of right now, there will be no power, there should be no power or water shutoffs um, allowed until December. Um, and so, um, again, if people are hearing about things that are happening that are not following that, then, you know, we definitely want to be kept abreast of, of that so that we're able to address those. Um, and again, until something changes, people are currently responsible for paying their bills in the future. And so while we're glad to know that there was some immediate action to kind of, you know, not have the most pressing issues you know, come for bills to be coming at this current point in time, or people, you know, have the threat of eviction, um, there is still a lot of collective work to do, um, because those those bills are going to pile up. Um, but there are immediate resources that are available. Great. Well, I mean, I think that that is really kind of the big issue, right, is that the bills are piling up for people, even if they are not in a situation where they uh, have to pay. And I know that um, something some clergy who are affiliated with TMO are starting to call for is a, a jubilee, uh, which would be just sort of a period of no rent or mortgage payments um, so that, you know, during this time of pandemic, which is really based in kind of a biblical idea that once every seven years you're supposed to, I mean, once every 50 years you're supposed to forgive all debts in society. And, um, you know, why not think about having that now during this time of pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, but that is, a, I suppose, a larger subject for another day. So we've talked about work and housing and utilities, right? But um, obviously another important thing that families need access to is food. And I know that TMO has been um, important in calling for the city of Houston and the Houston Independent School District to start opening up food distribution sites again with appropriate safety measures after the after HISD decided to close those down um, several days ago, and that that has now happened as of starting today, that HISD is now distributing food again um, with appropriate safety precautions. I'm just wondering if you had some more thoughts on where families can go right now if they need access to food. Yes, I would say that, you know, food access is probably one of the biggest trends that we heard right away from families, um, you know, just because it, they're especially with so many children at home now, um, they, you know, most of those, those students were getting, you know, multiple meals, if not all of their meals on weekdays from their campuses. And so we, you know, did make a call immediately for schools to be able to have, you know, those distribution sites with the right safety precautions in place. And we're glad to see that HISD was able to open those back up because families, um, you know, didn't have to have schools, I mean, didn't have to have children that were in the school district and they were getting essentially, you know, several days worth of groceries at a time. 
Um, and so we have posted, you know, most of the major school districts um, links to their websites so that you can see where the school distribution sites are. Some of them are rotating sometimes day to day just to make sure there's equitable access for all families throughout the school district. And um, we're keeping in close contact with the families of member of member institutions um, to, to see, you know, of the sites that have opened back up, is that serving them adequately? Because we also know that, you know, while there are, for example, in HISD five central sites that will be open each day, um, that transportation may be an issue. So if we do see that those are not enough, then we'll continue to reach out either to the district or to the food bank themselves to see if there's other options. Um, the Houston Food Bank is, you know, by and large, the, the largest distributor right now. Um, they do have a helpline as well as a number that you can text the word food to, and it'll actually tell you where the, the closest food pantry is to your area, um, which I think is really helpful. And then the other thing that we'll be making sure to continue to communicate, and this is still something that we are advocating for with our state level leaders, is to make it clear for people where um, people can access access kind of disaster um, SNAP benefits um, or other disaster related benefits um, now that Texas is under a disaster declaration. Um, and so those are a few of the places, but um, you know, that is going to be a, a continued place that some of our leaders are continuing to do research around to make sure that the information is getting out there. So is so Texas has been declared a state of, in a state of disaster. Um, and our disaster disaster SNAP benefits now available to people? They should be available. And from our understanding and talking with some of our local council people is that they're trying to figure out um, what the process is to, for people to safely apply and receive those um, receive those benefits. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they, they are in theory available, but people are still figuring out how to get access to them. Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, so we've talked uh, a lot about, you know, housing and food and uh, work. And one of the things that you mentioned early on was that uh, people had to have, you know, legal work status to have uh, access to unemployment benefits. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that legal work status is a big or legal status is a big issue during this pandemic because of the way that our government um, discriminate against undocumented families. And I'm wondering if you have any particular advice on uh, for undocumented families at this time and what they can be doing. Yeah. Um, no, I think this is a really important topic um, and high on the priority list of, of for, for TMO. Um, so I would say a few things that, you know, all families, regardless of their citizenship status, have access to is first and foremost, um, if there are people who are experiencing symptoms, especially severe symptoms of the coronavirus, is that um, the, the Harris County's um, you know, testing sites and programs, they do not require any type of documentation related to your citizenship to get tested for the virus. I know there's been, you know, some people kind of speculating on that. They, um, you can call in to do the online self-assessment. The call your nurse hotline also will connect people with other organizations that are able to give you know, free or highly reduced costs um, for, you know, healthcare um, and the testing sites, all they're asking for is if people are driving into those sites is that they just want to know the license plate of the car that you will be arriving in um, and they, they will not take down any of your other personal information. Um, and we have confirmed that with Paris Health um, that those will be, you know, safe places because it, it, it is obviously is a larger public health concern to make sure everybody who needs to get tested does have access to that test. Um, with a lot of the, you know, especially in HISD in the heart of the city with Fort Bend ISD, that um, the food distribution is not not specific to even their own students. As long as you arrive and you have a child with you, you'll be able to access that food. And then the, you know, statewide eviction and utilities moratoriums um, are, you know, applicable for all families. Um, as well as, you know, the mental health hotlines. I, there are, you know, obviously going to be families that will not be able 
able to access, um, you know, the stimulus bill package. Um, and so right now, what our leaders are currently in the process of doing is kind of looking forward to kind of the next wave of um, stimulus opportunities that will be coming down federally. I think where we see the opportunity is really around a lot of the um, loans that small businesses will be able to have access to. So with the current stimulus bill, um, there will be many small businesses that are able to, um, you know, for the employers themselves to be able to get loans to be able to keep their workers on payroll. Um, and so I think what we see is that we really have uh common ground with a lot of employers at this time for them to be able to keep their employees, you know, and keep their businesses going. And that um, to for us to continue to think about, you know, where are the, the industries um, and the occupations where a lot of families that may not have access to the stimulus package um, could be the businesses and the employers themselves able to access um, some of these payroll protection programs. And so I think for us, we are holding kind Kind of, um, you know, informational sessions for small businesses to apply for those, and as well looking forward to the gaps where um, this, you know, current stimulus bill may not uh, address all of the, the businesses in our neighborhoods. Um, and then I would say the last two things that we, um, you know, have as we've been talking to families is that, you know, for them to just stay close to the institutions that they are connected to, whether it's, you know, a faith-based organization or a congregation that they belong to, um, or some of the services that their schools are also providing as well. Um, we just got off a call earlier today with a wraparound specialist department in Houston ISD, and they're committed to make sure that every child right in their district, regardless of their background, has what they need um, to be able to, uh, you know, make sure that they're safe and healthy um, as they're navigating through this period of time. Well, I think, um, you know, one thing that I might just add in here is that the small business and payroll, small business assistance and payroll protection loan from the federal government is not just restricted to um, for-profit businesses. And so like a lot of TMO's member organizations, for instance, are eligible or could be eligible for them. I know that our church uh, applied for uh, both the SBA and the payroll protection uh, loan because we met the qualifications and I imagine that that is true for like a number of other nonprofits and religious communities. So, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I know that like we're afraid given the uh, economic situation we're going into that we'll see a significant loss in income for all sorts of reasons like we've lost all of our rental income as a church, which is very significant. Mm. Um, or excuse me, almost all of it. We have a, a daycare that's been declared an essential work because it services uh, medical workers, um, but everything else, you know, and uh, I imagine that quite a few other churches are, and, you know, mosques and synagogues are in similar situations. And so I would hope that religious communities that are part of TMO and other institutions that are part of TMO, if they haven't done so already, don't think they're qualified, uh, reach out to those uh, programs as well. Um, I think we're just about of, out of time. And so I'm wondering if before we close, you could say just a few more words about what else TMO is prioritizing at this time. Yeah. Um... Well, I definitely think that, you know, one of the things, you know, related to what we've been talking about is just that there's so much information that is moving so quickly out there. And so we want to continue to make sure that, you know, families, our member institutions and other organizations have access to things that are quickly changing. Um, and the two methods that we are doing that through is what we call house meetings, which is small group meetings so that people can really share um, the issues that are pressing for their families in, in a safer, small place. And so we're facilitating that virtually or digitally. Um, and the main intent of those is for people to feel less isolated and alone because they have the ability to make their private pain public and realize that many people are going through the same things. 
Um, and then for us to be able to identify leaders from those groups that will, you know, continue to work with us to advocate for families. And then the second way that we're kind of sharing information out with people is through what we call civic academies. Um, and for us, again, we'll be doing those kind of as webinars around important topics, whether that's how to apply for um, the payroll protection program, um, you know, how to kind of walk through some of the, the issues we've talked about today, um, or to preview other resources that we will be advocating for in the future. Um, but I would say that like the, the bigger piece that, you know, we're, we're finding time to kind of step back and reflect on is, is kind of the real opportunity that we have right now. Um, I don't think that probably for many of us, there has ever been a point, you know, in the past, you know, three, four decades where there has been such a spotlight sh like shining down on how essential, especially our lowest paid workers are in our country, that we would not be able to survive this pandemic if not for the frontline workers and that, you know, it is time for us to seize this moment to not only make sure that they have what they need in this current time, but that we are actually taking care of folks um, who are providing essential services so that they're getting paid just wages in the future. Um, I think the other thing that we, you know, recognize and are looking forward towards is that this whole process is going to be extremely, it's going to put a lot of pressure, especially on people um, who are kind of like the older workers in our system who are disproportionately being represented in a lot of the essential workers, a lot of home health workers, you know, food distribution workers, our truckers, you know, people who are working in farming um, are, you know, of the baby boomer generation and are likely to be forced into early retirement as well as, you know, really have their retirement savings, um, you know, being taken advantage of during this time. And so, I think the big, you know, headline that we're trying to impress upon all of our members and on ourselves is that we want to act so that we're able to address the issues of today, but also take this time to think about how we can remake tomorrow. Um, and so I think that's the real push for us. How can we make sure that families have what they need now, but that, you know, since all of us have our eyes open on just the vast inequities in our society, how we can also build these relationships so that we are able to, um, you know, remake a better future for all families um, in our communities. I think that last point is really important. Um, the economist Milton Friedman uh, has a quote that says you should never let a crisis go to waste. And now Milton Friedman, you may or may not know, was a very uh, free market economist who wanted to take the opportunities of economic and political crises to sort of reform society in a much more, you know, laissez-faire, every person for themselves, get rid of protections um, for uh, for working people, for political processes, um, social safety networks, uh, which is something that we've often seen and actually are seeing now to some extent during these kind of periods of crisis, right? I mean, like we're seeing uh, in Texas and in the country as a whole, sort of like almost uh, wish lists from right-wing organizations being enacted as policy, right? So the um, there's been essentially an aggressive union decertification process that's been approved by the National Labor Relations Board. There's uh, essentially a rollback on almost all environmental regulations here in the state of Texas. And I know this is a touchy one for TMO because of your member constituents come from a variety of different faith perspectives, but uh, abortions have been declared non-essential services and women's health is very much under attack. And so, you know, people of kind of on all sides of the political spectrum or all across the you know country are seeing this as an opportunity to kind of enact their um, their policy perspectives and their policy wish lists. And so I think that it's incredibly important that organizations like TMO, which really from my perspective, care about ordinary working people and kind of ordinary working families and society as a whole and a very you know, compassionate and particular way and want to say that everybody has the opportunity to have more of the good things in life um, are really speaking up about what we should be hoping for coming out of this, not just the people who are, say, looking at it as an opportunity to 
undermine labor unions further or uh, roll back environmental legislation. So I really appreciate that you all are engaging in that kind of forward thinking right now. Anyway, thank you, Diana, for joining us. And thank you for all of our members and viewers for joining us as well. I hope that you'll visit with us next week when we will be talking with essential workers from grocery stores who have been striking to, in response to unsafe working conditions. If you find this video helpful, I hope that you'll also think about joining us for our weekly worship services. They're posted online each Sunday at 10.30 a.m. and feature a sermon by one of our ministers, readings, prayers, and music by our award-winning musical director, Mark Vogel, as well as visual meditations from uh, award-winning artists. Thank you to our staff for making this video possible. It was filmed and produced by Christian Holmes. Alma Viscara assisted with the editing. We'll see you all online soon and in person as soon as it's possible for us to gather in again safely. And please remember that no matter how isolated you feel, we are all in this together.